Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. And today our program is The New Generation of Autism Researchers with uh, Susanna Curtis and Alexander Blum. But before we got to begin, Will, what's with the t-shirt this time? I'm glad you asked. This week's shirt is the Best Buddies, is a Best Buddies shirt. It, it represents the, the Best Buddies. S their friendship walk, Best Buddies is having their friendship walk next month and and I will, and I'm here spreading the word to our viewer to viewers like you. Thank you. And I know we're going to have uh, some further discussion of uh, the Best Buddies Friendship Walk later on in the program. But let's begin with our guest. Will, would you take it from here? Gladly. Our, our guest is Susanna Curtis. Tell us about how you came to your current research. Well, I started at the University of Chicago and I studied classics, Latin and Greek, because that was my special interest. And then my first job after I graduated was completely unrelated. I was an inclusion aide for an autistic boy from the time he was about three or four to the time he was about seven or eight. So I went through preschool and the beginning of primary school with him. I was sort of like a combination Billy Madison, Annie Sullivan. It was really fun to get to do all the grades again, but it was mostly great just to work with him. And while I was working with him, I met a lot of his specialists and they apparently told his mother without my knowing that they decided I was autistic as well. And uh, so they kept pressuring me to get a diagnosis and I didn't until I was about 26 or 27. And that sort of got me interested in autism research now. Your research focuses on autistic intelligence and autism and creativity. Can you explain? Uh, yes, I can. I think that autistic intelligence is consistently underestimated, especially with current IQ tests, the way they work, and especially with teacher perceptions of autistic children and how they learn. Uh, for example, on the, on the Wexler test, uh, kids, autistic kids perform significantly below neurotypical kids, but when they test them again on the Raven's progressive matrices and compare them, they're 30 percentile points higher than they were on the other. So it's really about how you test. For our viewers, could you tell us a little bit uh, about these two tests? I, I understand that the Wexler is a fairly commonly used IQ yeah, test, a, but I've never heard of the other one. Can you tell us about the both of Raven's these? The Raven's progressive matrices, to my knowledge, and correct me if I'm missing anything, um, are focus a lot more on nonverbal and spatial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like they're the embedded figures tasks are on there a lot. What and are... Sorry. You no, know, finish your answer. I was going to say autistic children tend to excel at embedded figure tasks. What are some of your initial findings? Uh, for the autistic intelligence, well, that um, there are a lot of people who are actually both autistic and gifted and that they get, this is something that in special ed we call twice exceptional or 2E mm -hmm. if you have a combination of a disability and uh, intellectual giftedness. And often the two can sometimes mask each other. So uh, children will not get their, get identified as autistic if maybe their giftedness is helping them compensate or they will not get identified as gifted if they're having disability-related troubles in the classroom, and how that just leads to missed and missed diagnoses. So what is autism and special interests? Well, special interests are my favorite thing to study. Um, I have a lot. My first was Babar, my second was, well, no, my second was probably Madeline, then I was very interested in conjoined twins for a long time. Uh, than classics, why I majored in classics. And now my special interest is special interests. Mm -hmm. So common special interests among uh, at least young autistic children, especially boys, would fall under the domain of planes, trains, and automobiles. Little boys love transportation mm -hmm. and elevators and Thomas the Tank Engine. Mm -hmm. And for young girls, it's usually horses or unicorns or arts and crafts. Uh, this is just typically, they could really be anything. My favorite article on the subject is called From Tarantulas to Toilet Brushes. The most obscure special interest I've seen is, was roadkill. Uh, anyway, special interests happen in about 90% of autistic people. And uh, according to, that's according to Tony Atwood. And they can be either a barrier or a bridge to socialization. 
Mm-hmm. So special interest can be isolating if you only want to talk about ham radio and nobody wants to hear about it. It can be isolating, but if your special interest is, uh, I guess, Minecraft, that could help you socially because a lot of kids are into Minecraft. How do you distinguish between, say, a, a strong interest and a special interest? And often aren't what may be considered a special interest uh, or an abnormal interest might simply be what it is, that if someone were interested in one thing, that would be considered perfectly acceptable, however fanatically they might be, and that another person's interest as fanatical might be considered very strange or unusual. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so a special interest is really all-encompassing. Mm-hmm. It is integral to a person's personality, heart and mind and soul, and you can't know the person without knowing about the mm-hmm. special interest. It's completely connected. It's how the person relates to the world is often through the special interest. That's, that's sort of an extreme. I've actually designed a scale to measure the intensity of special interests. I came up oh. with extremely intense interests, strong interest, moderate interest, and casual interest. And casual interest is about hobby level. Mm-hmm. And the casual interest, you would have no more specialized knowledge on the subject than, uh, than say, a, a regular hobbyist. And an extremely intense interest the person would have more specialized knowledge than most experts on the subject. And I did an interview, and or I, d- I did a survey, I conducted the survey, I got 42 responses, and I haven't analyzed the data yet because I don't know how, but Alexander's going to help me, <laughs> I hope. And yeah. I'm going to get an idea of where autistic people really fall in the range and whether the extremely intense interest is as common as 90%. Interesting. It also sounds like when you were talking earlier about what uh, the boys like and the girls like, it sounds very traditionally gender specific. Mm -hmm. And I'm a lay person, so I can't really speak to that, but I've heard that often gender identity among the autistic community is a little bit more fluid. So can you tell me, it sounds like, again, uh, boys' interests in what you're saying are very much Mm -hmm. traditional boys' things and girls' special interests are very traditional. Can you elaborate a little on what you found or what you think? Okay, it's definitely not a hard line. There are definitely boys who are interested in the arts and crafts, the horses. More boys than you would think actually are interested in My Little Pony. I know bronies are a a huge thing, but I'm not trying to be funny, actually. Young boys a lot of times really do like watching My Little Pony, and they don't tell people about it because Mm -hmm. they're embarrassed. But... And then there are girls who are into Thomas and elevators and trains. It's just not quite as common. And I've also heard about... uh, people on the spectrum being more gender fluid on average than the general population. Well, thank you. What other benefits come with special interests? Well, one thing that's been found is that a lot of the so-called impairments or uh, difficulties associated with and attributed to autism are mitigated or even disappear when a person is involved or engaged in an activity related to a special interest. For example, uh, children being interviewed about their special interests make more eye contact, they fidget less, they seem more at ease. Uh, Personally, I've noticed I always had issues with handwriting. I couldn't hold my pencil till sixth grade. I never got to go to recess because I always had to work on my handwriting. But if you watch me knit or do origami, you would never know I had an issue with fine motor stuff. So it's a question of is it a deficit that you had or is it just an issue of, of accessibility. We're, giving, we're asking people to do tasks that just are incompatible with their skill set. Do you think teachers these days um, maybe are following that more, like letting the child talk about more of their special interest and realizing the difference? Yeah, you know, they're not fidgeting as much. They're really into this. Instead of trying to, I don't want to say force them to, to, to th- focus on something else that... Um, a subject that they really just can't seem to pass? Um. Well, um, research articles are really calling for teachers to embrace special interests. Oh, good. Good. And are suggesting that students be allowed to do their projects, book reports, Mm -hmm. uh, research projects based on their special interests. There's Mm -hmm. even a book about it called Just Give Him the Whale, and it's directed at teachers Mm -hmm. telling them, let the kid have his toy whale already and he will will do much better yes my mother taught second grade and she had a a student who was very into tornadoes and so one day we made him a tornado quiz and we left it on his desk and it was the happiest he was all year 
Excellent material, Susanna. Thank you very much. And, and now we'll go on to your colleague, Alex Blum. Will. Tell us about how you came to your current research. Okay. Well, I used to be a high school English teacher where I taught 10th to 11th grade language arts for kids with special needs. And one of the biggest challenges I had was reading comprehension and getting the class engaged. And, you know, I, I talked to other teachers, I looked for resources, but um, during my master's program, when I was a teacher, I read an article on comics, that comics can be a great tool for reading comprehension. And, you know, so I, I brought in a graphic novel on the Holocaust. Uh, Mouse? No, uh, X Men. Oh, Magneto's Testament. It, it was. It's a historically accurate graphic novel about his life, growing up in Germany, uh, during World War II. And I saw my class light up in a way I'd never seen before. They were engaged. They were connecting the story to their world knowledge, in a way that I hadn't seen before. And it was especially helpful for my autistic students. They were able to pick up on nuances about characters and their intentions and, and their motives and themes and morals that weren't as discussed in traditional text. So seeing the impact of that, I made my thesis of mm -hmm. using comics versus text, and it was an exciting experience, and, it, and I had preliminary evidence that you know comics can help autistic individuals reading comprehension. So then I decided to get my PhD and further investigate how we can use visual narratives in this capacity. And here I am today. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So in your studies and in your research, do you have any idea why this works well? Why this works better? Why uh, comics and multimedia approaches seem to work better with well, autistic people? I think it has to do with recognizing different dispositions in thinking. Um, you'll find research that will show that autistic individuals have a disposition towards visuals and, and, and mm -hmm. that these help scaffold social information. Um, so the pictures are definitely one attribute of comics. However, the other aspect to consider is the format, right? Mm -hmm. It's sequential images, mm -hmm. the framing. Because of that, you can manipulate time. You can look at the past, present, and future at your own pace as it scaffolds what's happening mm -hmm. from event A to event B to event C. And I think that coupled with the images makes it more intuitive to make the latent social information more apparent. And it allows more integration of world knowledge with the story, which is something we always strive for. Excellent. Have there been any studies which show that for like, um early education of autistic, profoundly affected autistic individuals that instead of trying to initially teach them with text, you initially try and teach them with uh, graphic material? Well, I, I don't see it so much as a one or the other mm -hmm. or that one should replace something else. They, they should be used together as supplementary material. It's not that comics only help autistic individuals and, and, and there's nothing mm -hmm. to gain from typically developing individuals, that they both help. And certain contexts will warrant one format more than the other. But the point of the format is to think of it in terms of accessibility. Mm -hmm. So if I show a traditional text and I ask inference questions about why characters engage in intentional actions or right. what lessons of the stories are or what characters learn, I believe, and, and this is what my research uh, focuses on, is that if you replace that in a comic format that you'll be more likely to integrate your world knowledge with the story. Mm -hmm. And that if that's the case, was there ever a deficit to start with? Right? Because in one format, you might see differences in inferencing. And research has shown that there are differences in inferencing skills, more local based than global based um, when reading traditional texts. But if you show a comic and you don't find differences in inferencing anymore, was it an issue of accessibility that they needed help accessing the format to engage in these higher order thinking skills rather than seen as a deficit in global processing, for example? That is really profound because mm -hmm. I know traditionally one of the symptoms of autism has been considered 
a deficit in being able to pick up social nuances. And it simply sounds like, or I shouldn't say simply, at least in a lot of cases from what I'm hearing you say, it's just a matter of accessibility. You might not be able to pick it up on the text or in some other medium, but in other types of medium you can pick up as well as a neurotypical. And, and manga is even especially conducive for, for this type of thinking as well, because manga focuses more on landscape than dialogue mm -hmm. and the faces and characters are more iconic than realistic compared to Western comics um, but to add on to this notion of accessibility it goes back to what Susanna said about the fine motor skills mm -hmm. if we're doing a task that requires fine motor skills and I have challenges that's one thing but if it's my special interest area as you mentioned about knitting and those challenges seem to dissipate well was it an issue of ability or was it an issue of accessing the, the activity mm -hmm. and accessing the activity in a special interest area promotes not intuitively naturally uh, more skill set excellent Stacy tell us about your uh, current research project okay well going back to this notion of accessibility in comics mm -hmm. I'm trying to show that very notion that comics do promote accessibility. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a story in text format and in comic format. And I'm going to have my uh, different students, autistic and neurotypical, uh, read this comic and answer inferencing questions about it. Why, why characters engage in intentional actions, mm -hmm. lessons of the story, and what made them think of those answers. And what I want to show is that through contemporary approaches to measurement, that although there may be a disposition, a preference for local inferencing when it comes to figuring out why characters do things mm -hmm. in traditional texts, that if we find that difference in traditional texts, but if we do it in comic and we don't find that difference anymore, right? That they are integrating their world knowledge and engaging in inferencing in, in, in a more sophisticated manner, mm -hmm in comic format, then those differences are washed out. Mm -hmm. And it make, and the goal is for us to question our previous assumptions about capability and to focus on disposition of thinking, disposition, preference, mm -hmm. bias, mm -hmm. um, and to capitalize on that and to build off of that um, through visual narratives. Thank you very much, Alex. I believe we'll be getting back with you later on in the program. This has been a fascinating program, and in conclusion, we'd like to find out from both of you where your individual research is going and where you believe that the uh, next generation of autism researchers uh, will be leading us as a group. Well, for me, I think the future of autism research involves embracing the neurodiversity paradigm and letting go of the pathology paradigm, the medical model. That means not always publishing in medical journals anymore publishing in more uh, different academic journals, disability studies journals. It means getting autistic people involved in the research, more autistic students who go to graduate school, more autistic students who become autism researchers. Uh, it involves thinking of autism as a difference and not as uh, just a collection of deficits. It involves not using patronizing and euphemistic uh, language like person first language, like person with autism instead mm -hmm. of autistic person. It involves respecting the wishes mm -hmm. of actually autistic people, the self advocates who form organizations and who tell us how they want to be referred to. Mm -hmm. yeah. It involves respecting that. And that means if a journal won't publish your article because you're not using person first language, you find another journal. You don't snap your backbone. Thank you. And where do you see your research going? Um, well, my next step is I'm going to be doing research on why teachers need to understand the neurodiversity paradigm and how that will make them better teachers if they can be responsive to their autistic students' needs. Thank you. And Alexander, can you tell us uh, your thoughts? Building off of this neurodiversity movement, um, I want to continue, and I, and I think the field will also continue building upon this notion <coughs> of disposition instead of deficit. Mm -hmm. Looking at what are the cognitive processing biases that are, and looking for formats and looking for activities and looking for, for pedagogical uh, practices that are conducive 
for those dispositions. Mm -hmm. So you can capitalize on that instead of doing a drill repeat of the deficit that is appearing to be there. Um, and I would like to continue my research in knowing how to use different modalities of narratives, uh, such as comics, mm -hmm. um, that are multimodal in, in, in nature to promote comprehension and to perhaps capitalize on the story architecture and use that to promote uh, reading comprehension as well. Excellent. Well, I thank you both. Uh, your work is very, very profound. And I don't say that for much of what we have, but I think your work is really groundbreaking and we are very uh, pleased and honored to have you here with us. Thank you. And we know we'll be hearing more from you in various ways. So thank you again, Alexander Blum and Susanna Curtis. Uh, folks, this week, uh, okay, all right. And now Stacey Kennedy will deliver our cultural report. Thank you. Okay, what I'd like to share today is uh, Tuesday, March 27th, there will be a showing of this, um, of a movie called Keep the Change with a neurodiverse um, cast. And um, it'll be showing at the, it'll be showing at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco at 7 p.m. March 27th. Ascend, our group is participating, no, excuse me, partnering with C Creativity Explored, the Disability Superfest, and the Roxy Theater for this SF premiere of, of the film, uh, Keep the Change. And Greg Gates, who is our one of our co-chairs and a handyman, Zen student, and other authors of uh, like Dragon Puzzles, Story, and AutismTheory.org, and GodZen.net, he will be participating in a Q&A after the film. Saturday, excuse me, Saturday, April 14th, is the second annual Dance-a-thon for Autism at 2 to 6 p.m., and it'll be located um, at Cubberley Pavilion, 4000 Middlefield Road in Palo Alto. It is a fun-filled benefit for Bay Area Autism nonprofits. And then um, Saturday, April 28th, is the Autism Awesomeness event at, um, in San Rafael, the address is uh, 10 Bayview. It's supposed to be a prehistoric, um, prehistorical, not prehistorical, but it's a church that's on a mountain. But again, 10 Bayview, San Rafael, California, 94901. It starts at 1. And um, Karen Kaplan, who, who runs the nonprofit um, called Offerings, she will be hosting this event. It'll, there will be a talent show, and there will be other connections you can make with people. So thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Now we'll hear uh, Will with our special guest, Wes Lamb, who will be discussing uh, Mass Buddy's Friendship Walk. Gladly. How long have Best Buddies been doing the Friendship Walk for? So first of all, my name is Wesley Lamb, and I'm one of the volunteers over the best, for the Best Buddies Friendship Walk this year in, for the SF Bay Area. and. Nationwide, um, the best best place have been doing their friendship walk since 2009, according to their national website. And ever since then, more than 80,000 people across across 35 across 55 states in America are participating in the best place friendship walk. And what's the perp includes Cal the state of California and San Francisco included for the Bay Area. And the main purpose of the best place friendship walk is to raise awareness. And support inclusion of people with IDDs into society. Now, if you're wondering what IDDs stand for, they, IDDs, IDDs is short for in, people, with in, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, for, and, our, and our main purpose of Best Buddies is that we provide programs for, for people with IDDs through one-on-one -on -one friendships, job slash job career development programs, and leadership programs. Thank you. Next question. What do you hope to get out of the Friendship Walk? <clears throat> what, I, what I hope to, to get out of the Friendship Walk? Well, all, my, all the proceeds that money raised from the Friendship Walk, in which we're aiming for $125,000 this year, goes to support these programs I previously mentioned, which are friendships, job, 
slash career development programs and leadership programs. And I hope that the, that anybody with IDD's best buddies will benefit from these programs. Now, I obviously feel bad for those people who have disabilities and IDDs of any age, regardless of their kid or adult, because some of them never got to be asked out by a friend to go out to uh, have ice cream or go see the new movie, like the latest Marvel or Star Wars movie, or hand out how to play video games or watch the, watch the uh, latest TV show on Netflix, Crunchyroll, etc. And, or even go to a school dance or even go on a date. I mean, and even worse, not odd, not even worse, most people with IDDs don't have the same employment opportunities as their pe regular peers or career advancement opportunities because they're different from everybody else. But we're here to change, but I hope that the Best Place Friendship Walk definitely change, changes, the pro changes that, no that notion. I mean, I never went to, personally, I never, for me, I never went to a school or college that has a Best Place program and I never got to experience any of those programs until I started volunteering for the SF Bay Area Northern California chapter in 2016. And Ever since two, and I've been volunteering there for two years in several capacities, including helping out the uni University of San Francisco chapter, and it opened, it definitely opened up a new perspective of, about people with IDDs and how, what they are going through every single day of their lives. I, but to be honest with you, I really hope that the money raised for the walk will help out people with IDDs in a way that will change their lives in a positive way. Thank you. Now, now I know after the conclusion, of, now I know after the conclusion of the walk, but before the closing ceremonies, there is a festival called the Festival of Friendship. Can you tell our viewers what the Festival of Friendship is about? Okay, so every single, so every single year we have to walk in the opening ceremonies, and then after that, we have a little finish line there. I'll lead into the Festival of Friendship. Now, you're wondering what the Festival of Friendship is? Well. It is not a separate event from the Best Place Friendship Walk, but it is part of the program for the Best Place Friendship Walk. Now, we plan to start the Festival Friendship around 10.45 a.m. It is our current estimated arrival time for the, for, for the first team to cross the finish line. Now, what a Festival Friendship is, it's a really fun festival event for our walk participants, to, not, only for, to complete, not only to celebrate them completing the walk, but also to celebrate the inclusion of people with IDDs into society. And we have various fun activities that we're currently planning right now, such as a bounce house and some healthy food and drink tents, just to name a few that we have planned right now. Plus, we also have musical and dance performances from local music, not only local musicians or who who appear like who, not only from local musicians or dance that cheer perform cheer performances, but also several performances from disability groups as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Wes. Could you tell our viewers uh, where and when the Best Buddies Friendship Walk will be located? Yeah, so the Best Buddies Friendship Walk is, is, will be a really fun and exciting event. It will be taking place at the Music Concourse in San Francisco's Golden Cape Park <coughs> on Saturday, April 21st from 8 a.m. to noon. Excellent. And if people between now and then want to find out more information, uh, how can they do that? Well, they want to find out more information or they want to join a team, sign up for the Friendship Walk, etc. They, can, they should visit bestbuddiesfriendshipwalk.org slash Bay Area to sign up or join a team and start raising some money for, to support people with IDDs. Well, thank you very much, Wes. Appreciate it. And very best of luck to you and all the Best Buddies at the Friendship Walk. Well, thank you again uh, for this week's program of Send Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Stacey Kennedy. Wesley Lamb. Susanna Curtis. Alexander Blum. Thank you very much, and until next time, uh, have a great week. Bye-bye.